this evening, and it is good to be back in the house of the Lord. Amen. Take your Bibles and turn to the book of Ezekiel. The book of Ezekiel in chapter 10. And we're getting close to finishing up this chapter. And if you've noticed, we've been kind of jumping around the verses in this chapter instead of taking them one right after the other. But our thoughts have been one right after the other and, and kind of the way I was led, I guess. Tonight we'll be looking primarily at verse 12. of our chapter. And we, of course, this chapter has been dealing with providence as a big majority of it has been dealing with the cherubim and the wheels and the faces, which are a carryover from chapter 1. We a couple weeks ago, I had looked at the motions of providence. Before that, the employment of providence. Last week, we looked at the administration of providence. And this week's title goes kind of hand in hand with the administration of providence. The administrator or the one who rule providence is under is God, the sovereign one. All providence is administered by him, and so as being administered by him is under his sovereign rule. That is, he did, as we looked at last week and many of the verses, he dispenses it as he wills, as he pleases, as he deems necessary to accomplish his purpose. Not my purpose or your purpose, but his purpose. Let's read verse 12 tonight before we go much further. This, and their whole body, that's talking about the cherubim and their backs and their hands and their wings and the wheels were full of eyes round about even the wheels that they four had. What do you see as you look at that verse? <laughs> well, the, the first thing that jumps out at me here is they're all in unity. They were unified. It's unity in the work. They all had the same appearance with the exception of their faces as was in chapter 1. Same appearances that we see, with the exception of their faces, and we determined that that was even the same, even though it, it mentioned the one of a cherub, the face of a cherub, we determined that it was the face of an ox, which was what was missing from chapter 1. So they all had the same appearance with the exception of their faces, and they were united in the work as one. Well, that makes sense, does it not? Remember, they, they moved, they went when the Spirit went, and the Spirit was in them all. And the Spirit of who? It was the Spirit of God. So it makes sense that they, they were united 
in their movement and in their work and, and everything that they did to accomplish. It was under God's direction. He is, he is one. <laughs> Turn with me to the book of Mark. The book of Mark. And chapter 12. Mark chapter 12 and verse 29. We read, And Jesus answered him. That is, the one who had come to him. One of the scribes, a rich young ruler. And Jesus answered him, the first of all the commandments is hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. <laughs> one. <laughs> Whether he's manifesting himself as God the Father or God the Son or God the Holy Spirit is one. They are one. And you will not find the sun going, the manifestation of the sun going contrary to the manifestation of the Father, or you will not find the, the, the Holy Spirit of God, the Spirit of God going contrary to God the Father. Amen. And that's why Jesus said, I do always <laughs> those things that please my Father. Amen. Oh, that you, oh, that I could say that tonight, that all, did always those things that pleased my Father. That's my prayer daily. I, my prayer daily is that I bring honor and glory to his name. And, and, and if I don't do all that pleases him, then I'm not bringing honor and glory, uh, at least some of the time, to his name. So we carry that thought with us back to the book of Deuteronomy. And, and actually we could, we could carry it on back to Exodus, the 20th chapter, but we'll just go to Deuteronomy in chapter 6 and, and where Moses is uh, summarizing their experiences. Chapter 6 and verse 4. We read, Hear, O Israel, the Lord God is one Lord. He's one. Isn't that, isn't that what Jesus just quoted? Yep. Jesus in Mark chapter 12 and verse 29 just quoted this portion of Scripture from Deuteronomy chapter 6 Amen. and verse 4. Turn with me now to the 32nd chapter of Deuteronomy. The 32nd chapter of Deuteronomy. Verse 3, we read, Because I will publish the name of the Lord... Ascribe ye greatness unto our God. He is the rock. Amen. His work is perfect. Amen. <laughs> uh, if there was any discord, it'd not be perfect, would it? The church of the Lord Jesus Christ is to be as one. But many times, the flesh gets to fighting against another flesh, and we're not as one. <laughs> and so then, before God, our work is not perfect. But God <laughs> doesn't fight with himself. Amen. His work is perfect. For all his ways are judgment... A God of truth, <laughs> no untruth, 
If there was any untruth, it would be imperfect. His works would be imperfect. And see, as he is directing these cherubim by his spirit, he's directing these cherubim and these wheels and these faces, however you please and want to divide it up. It's perfect. Amen. It's, it's in unity. It is as one as we've studied before concerning them. And without iniquity, just and right is he. See, anything short of perfection is iniquity. Is it not? It, that's why we're told in the book of Romans, chapter 3 and verse 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Imperfect. We, we, we miss the mark of perfection. That's what God requires. <laughs> and if we miss the mark of, require, of perfection, we're sinners. Amen. We've sinned. We've broken the law of God, which is sin, transgression. So jumping down now to verse 39, verse 39 of the same chapter, after all these verses in between and everything that is said, he says, See now that I, even I, am he. I'm that Lord God. I'm that rock. I'm that one whose work is perfect. I'm that one in whom is truth. You see, I am he. And there is no God with me. I kill and I make alive. I wound and I heal, neither is there any that can deliver out of my hand. Listen, he, he, he just went to the providence of God there. I kill, I make a lot. That's God's providence. Yes. He allows us to be alive. He made a lot. From the, from, from the time of conception, he allowed life in the womb. He allowed that life to come to birth. He allowed me to be, well, in a few days, 69 years of age, if he wills. And at any time he wills, <laughs> he can kill. Yep. He can take this life away. Amen. He does it all the time with the lives of men. That is his providence at work. He's one God. He's sovereign. He is the ruler of all of his providence. One more uh, on that subject. Turn with me to the book of Psalms. Psalms in chapter 33. Psalms 33 and verse 4. For the word of the Lord is right. And all his works, <laughs> that's his works of providence, as we're studying tonight and the past several nights. All his works are done in truth. That tells me that they're done in unity. They're done in oneness. They're done under his leadership, under his guidance, under his will, under his good pleasure, his desire. Also, in this verse, the 12th verse, let me get back there. We notice that God is omniscient. Do we not? That is, he's all-knowing. He said, they were full of eyes 
round about, even the wheels that they four had, full of eyes, round about. Well, in the, uh, in the first chapter, what, what did we read there in the first chapter in verse 18? It, it, similar statement, only we might think that it wasn't full of eyes, round about, but uh, here's what it said in the first chapter in verse 18. As for their rings, that is the rings that were around the wheels, they were so high that they were dreadful, and their rings were full, full of eyes round about them four. In other words, all four wheels were full of eyes, all, all around them, all about them. They were full of eyes. Well, being full of eyes, that, does that not speak of God's omniscience? Of his ability to know everything that's going on? He knows. <laughs> he sees. There's nothing that is hid from the eye of Almighty God. Turn with me to 2 Chronicles. 2 Chronicles, and you ought to know this passage of Scripture well. 2 Chronicles, in chapter 16. And look at verse 9. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth. His eyes are running to and fro throughout the whole earth. And, and that means he sees. Unless he's blind and God is not blind. <laughs> Let me assure you he's not blind. Don't you think for a minute he's blind. Amen. Because he might just show you otherwise. You see? His eyes are running to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. Herein thou hast done foolishly, therefore... From henceforth thou shalt have wars. I mean, they did foolishly. The verdict on, on them was they'd done foolishly because, because they, they thought that God didn't see, God didn't know. And he here is letting them know that he did see his eyes are running to and fro throughout the whole world to show himself strong. Do we know, are we aware, and we say yes, we're, we know, we are, we're aware that God sees all, <laughs> but are we aware of it every moment of the day? No, we go on about our lives a lot of times like, like we're not aware of it. Like, as we've said before, just because I'm hiding it from Brother Ron, I think I'm home scot-free. But no. Just because I'm hiding it from Brother Ron, there's still one who sees and knows. God sees. God knows. And he's the one to whom we're all, whether saved or lost, <laughs> We all have to give an account one day before him. Turn with me to the book of Job. The book of Job. In chapter 34. In verse 21. Here, the Word of God records for us the comments that Elihu made when he said, For his eyes, referencing God, are upon the ways of man. 
and he seeth all his goings. Yep. Amen. And, and not just upon the save. <laughs> right. His way, his eyes are upon man. <laughs> all man. All man. And furthermore, as it applies to, to our text, his eyes are upon all his creation. He, he, he knows all about his creation. He knows about every star up there. There's not a star falls from the sky, but what he doesn't know it. Right. Amen. We talk about the passage in the New Testament about not a hair from our head falls to the ground without him knowing it. We're more precious than, than many sparrows. Yes. And there's not a one of something little insignificant as a sparrow that falls to the ground but what God doesn't know it. And he says, you're more valuable than many sparrows. And then he says, not a hair of your head falls to the ground without your father Amen. knowing about it. Amen. He's aware of it all. His eyes are upon all his creation. Those, something little and insignificant as a, as a little bird, a sparrow. The insects. All of it. Amen. His eyes are upon it. And it's under his control. Turn with me to the book of Psalms. The book of the Psalms in chapter 11. And these are just a few scriptures that I picked out to read tonight. That, <laughs> the Word of God is full yes. of scriptures concerning the what God knows. He knows it all. He's, so therefore, he's omniscient. Amen. Omni, which means all. Omniscient, which means knowledge. He's all-knowing. All he has all knowledge. Psalms, the 11th chapter and verse 4. The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold, his eyelids try the children of men. <laughs> I mean, his eyes not only behold, his eyes not only see, but his eyelids try, it says, proves <laughs> men. Oh. We, we worship and serve a great God. A great God. We need to see that. And yes, in our text, Ezekiel is, is beholding it. This is, this, is the, this is some of the portion of what, what God is showing Ezekiel. But as we, as we go on, it's not only Ezekiel he's showing. He's going to show this. He's showing this to Israel. That he sees and he knows. <laughs> they thought they could hide it from the eye of God. They thought he didn't, he didn't know. And if he does know, he doesn't care. Remember that back in the 8th chapter? Yep. Oh, he didn't care. <laughs> well, we get in the 11th chapter, and, and we had it several times before that. I think it was in the 6th chapter. We had it. That they may know that I am the Lord. <laughs> See, that's the purpose of this. That they may know that I am the that you and I might know that he is the Lord. Yes. He's the sovereign. He's in control. He rules over all of his providence. He rules over all of his works. And all of his works are perfect. As we've already read. Tonight. One more on this subject. The book of Proverbs. 
book of Proverbs in chapter 15, and I learned verse 1 many, many, many years ago. I, well, I learned that it was in the scriptures many years ago. I haven't always, can, can I always say that I've learned the principle of verse 1, a soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up strife. But we want to look at verse 3. And we ought to know just as importantly that the, verse 3 here exists, and we ought to, we ought to know it. it. That is, we ought to know it by experience. Verse 3, the eyes of the Lord are in every place beholding the evil and the good. <laughs> beholding the evil and the... Listen, he, yes, he sees what, what, when I do those things that please him, but he also sees when I don't. Right. Amen. He also sees when I don't. Amen. And he's, he's beholding... He's beholding the good that he's created in all of his children tonight, and he's beholding the evil that is in the unbelievers, those who are perishing, those who are in darkness, who, as John chapter 3 says, are already condemned. You see, because they, why? Because they believe not. Another thing that we notice in this portion of Scripture in our text is actually we, we drop down to verse 17 to pick this up, but the Spirit of God directs them. We've already uh, alluded to that. We've touched on it in the past. We mentioned it uh, tonight one time. Uh, but verse 17 of our text it says, when they stood, that is, the cherubim, when they stood, they stood, and when they were lifted up, these lifted up themselves also. For the spirit of the living creature was in them. The spirit of God was in them, was in the living creature, the living creature being the cherubim. And the Spirit of God was in the living creature, was in the cherubim, and it was in the wheels, it was in them all. And moving under the Spirit's direction. And that is e even more clear as we studied the first chapter of the book of Ezekiel there, that it was under the direction of the Spirit of God, which is under the direction of God. The Spirit of God directs them when they go. God, God's always at work. Oh, yes. Behold, God is not a God that he should slumber nor sleep. <laughs> Turn with me to the book of John. The book of John, in chapter 5. In verse, uh, verse 17. But Jesus answered them, My father worketh hitherto. Who's the father of Jesus? God. God the Father. And I work. And I work. <laughs> we already started off this, this, this message tonight. The one. Yes. There's one God. One. Amen. 
And, and not only does the Father work hitherto and the Son work hitherto, but the Spirit also. Yes. God is, is always at work. Whether he's manifesting himself as the Father or whether he's manifesting himself as the Son or whether it's a manifestation of the Holy Spirit of God. It's always working. Amen. And you think about, you think about <laughs> all of this creation, the heavens and the earth. Yeah. Well, there ain't no man big enough to handle it. Wow. <laughs> they, you could take the whole population of the world and it wouldn't be big enough to handle it. I mean, they can't handle, handle what, what they think they know. They don't even, <laughs> they don't even know the truth. Amen. And furthermore, they don't want us to know either. They want us to be all confused. Like I said, well, like I was telling my mother this week, the right, right hand lies, the left hand lies. All men are liars. <laughs> God's not a liar. Amen. You know, we can't trust man. We can't put, put confidence in what man says. But we can count on what God says. Amen. It is truth as we've looked at tonight. And he works. Always at work in this vast universe. Verse 17 said, For the spirit of the living creature was in them was in them. They, they have the same spirit. The same spirit. Not one spirit in the living creatures and another spirit in the wheels and another spirit in the faces. One. Amen. They have the same spirit. And God directs all. All. Everything. <laughs> according to his divine purpose, which was purposed before the foundation of the world. Turn with me to the book of Ephesians. The book of Ephesians in chapter 1. In verse 11. Well, I guess we need to read verse 10 for That is the dispensation of the fullness of times. He might get, gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him, in Christ. That is, God is working. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. Amen. After the counsel of his own pleasure, desire, purpose, yeah. his will. And he's working everything according to that divine desire, pleasure, will that he hath. Turn with me to the book of Isaiah. The book of Isaiah. In chapter 46. In verse 10. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done 
saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. His counsel from ancient times, from eternity, <laughs> is going to stand. Amen. And all his pleasure <laughs> shall be done. Turn with me to the book of Jeremiah. The book of Jeremiah, chapter 32. Look with me here at verse 19. Great in counsel and mighty in work, for thine eyes are open upon all the ways of the sons of men to give every one according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. <laughs> God is giving to each one, every one of us, according to his pleasure, according to his will, what he desires and pleases. And that according to to man's works. In other words, that whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. You want to reap good things? <laughs> then you better be sowing good things. You want to reap? You don't care what you reap? You go ahead and sow, as, you, as they say, your wild oats your wild oats <laughs> and you'll reap of those wild oats his counsel stands his purpose stands and he is great in that counsel do we see him great in his counsel in his purposes in his plans well we do as long as everything is going what we consider to be good. But I'll be honest with you, there's some things that just don't seem to be so good. And then we don't think he's doing so good. We don't think he's so great in that council, do we? Well, he said it was for our good. He said it was for our good. If we're born again, if we're called by him, that's for our good, you see. And he determines what is good. All right, we'll quit there tonight. Next week we'll go on and we'll be looking at the glory of God removing, departing, he hadn't, he hadn't departed yet. We saw in the ninth chapter indications that, that he's getting ready, he's moving. He's, he's getting ready to move out of there. In the tenth chapter, we see more indications that he's moving, he's, he's getting ready to get out of there. And in the eleventh chapter, we see him leaving the city. Our dear Heavenly